Amen. Good morning. I am Jake Porter, and it's so good to be back here with you all after uh, being gone for a couple weeks on vacation. Uh, This morning, we are starting a new series about uh, the women of Jesus' genealogy, and I'll tell you a lot more about that when we get to the sermon. Uh, First of all, immediately following worship, uh, Ed Taminga is going to be walking through uh, more, uh, continuing our discernment about women as elders. So please come uh, right after service, get your coffee and your cookies, Finish those out there, and then come back in here, and Ed Taminga will get started with that. Uh, And then um, after the education hour, we have a potluck, which is uh, really, really cool because potlucks are one of the ways that we know that God loves us and wants us to be happy. So, at least that's what I think. So uh, after the education hour, we're all going to meet in the fellowship hall for potluck. If you didn't bring anything, if you're not prepared, don't freak out. We got you covered. I'm saying in faith. (laughs) So uh, you are all welcome, and I look forward to uh, being able to share a meal with you all. And then finally, uh, my wife and I would like to say thank you to all of you who gave us cards during Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, They mean a lot to be um, encouraged and supported uh, in uh, in this endeavor. So let's stand together as we begin worship this morning. When asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus said... The Shema sums up all the law and the prophets. So let's dedicate ourselves, let's pledge our allegiance to God once again by saying the words of the Shema. So please repeat after me. Hear, O people of God. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God. With all of your heart. With all of your, heart. With all of your soul. With all, your soul. With all of your mind. With all, your mind. With all of your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Amen. One final instruction before we get started. Uh, please scoot to one end or the other. Make the empty spaces in your rows on the aisles. So that way anyone coming in while we begin worship can find a place to sit. I am so excited to worship the Lord God Almighty with you. Let's go.
brothers and sisters, you may be seated. As we come into our offering this morning, let's have a, a spirit of generosity, a spirit of desire to hear the Spirit move in our midst, to know that God is active and present with us, to know that as we give in this moment, we are also receiving And all we are doing is giving back to God what he has already given to us. So let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your provision. For your kindness towards us. For your grace. For your uh, pouring out of your gifts to us. Almighty God, we thank you that we are uh, privileged to call on the name of the Lord and know that we have been saved. We thank you for this time that we can come together and give back to you. A token of our obedience, a token of our lives that are given to you wholeheartedly. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, uh, the little ones, the children's worship age, which is three through kindergarten, age three through kindergarten, can come on to the front, and we're going to gather here and bless them. And while they're coming down, uh, brothers and sisters, the Lord God Almighty is here this morning. The Lord God welcomes you into his presence with love, joy, grace, and peace. And I ask that you would welcome one another in the same way. You may be seated. And Bennett, are you going to join us here, bud? Oh, did he leave already? (laughs) Great. Uh, If everyone could extend your hands towards the kids, and we're going to bless them as they go to children's worship. And so we extend our hands. Kids, what do you do? When someone's going to give you something, what do you do? Good job. You stick your hands out to catch it. Let's say together, may the Lord bless you as we worship and grow together. Amen. All right. You all are going this way. Have a good day, Owen. Do you want to stay here with me, or do you want to go downstairs? Come. Um, so, you all get to participate in our parenting together. Uh, isn't that fun? So, I am going to buy time, because the next thing that we're going to do is Aaron Egabeen is here, right? There he is. Uh, Aaron is going to interview my wife uh, because she is a new staff member, and we wanted to make sure that all of you had an opportunity to get to know a little about her, and I lost the microphones. There they are. Um, So she's coming. At some point, she'll be here. There you are. You're up. Sorry. (laughs) Yes. All right, is this one on? All right, good. Yeah, so uh, obviously we were up here before and kind of announced Chris just in general, but we thought it would be great to put her on the spot right up here in front of you all so we could get to know her a little bit. Um, I really don't know what he's going to ask, so. No, that's, that's yeah. true. I'll try to be e- easy as I can. So um, I just thought if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and then in some ways how God led you to be a worship leader. Okay, well... My name is Chris Boos Porter. I am from the north side of Holland originally, and I grew up in Hudsonville. I graduated from Trinity Christian and then went on to Hillsdale College where I met this lovely young man. He's younger than I am, so I graduated, and he followed me back to West Michigan and hasn't left. Um, (laughs) I um, have always been involved in worship. Uh, My mom is a piano teacher here in Hudsonville, and she has been involved in leading worship since the 70s, so I kind of grew up with it. I think I was on a worship team for the first time when I was like, I don't know, 13 or something, very young. And so it's always been part of my DNA. I teach piano now and lead worship, and actually I saw the job description for the worship planner job and told Jake that he needed to apply to this random church in Hudsonville so I could have this job. (laughs) So thank you. (laughs) It was like literally, it was backwards. Like I said, I can't apply because that would be weird if we go to different churches. And so you need to work here. I know there's that church in Canada, but there's this other church in Hudsonville that I think would be great. Um, So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I'm still getting my feet wet, but yeah. And we have two little boys who, one is not with us, and he's a little pistol right now, but thanks for your love for him, too. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, this one's a little more specific. Do, okay. you, do you have a favorite worship song or oh, hymn? So I had some rough times. There was some stuff that happened, and I loved the desert song. I don't, I don't know if it's the song that we sing here. But I knew that if I could sing that song, then... My faith was still with me, and I could, I could, God was going to do it. He was going to be faithful. So, yeah, probably that one. Cool. 
Um, good. Um, I know one thing, um, getting to know you guys a little bit, was kind of appreciating your skills for organization and planning. Because um, some of us, like me, might just kind of show up on Sundays and be amazed at how everything seems to go really well. Uh -huh. um, so if you could maybe give us a little bit of background into what does it, what does your role really look like in terms of planning and um, how do you work with Jake in terms of looking at types of songs? So Jake plans, no, I plan way, I plan Jake way in advance. We talk about things, he knows what he wants to do next summer, he, and so we, we generally plan worship to be revolving around the scripture passage. So I didn't choose the songs today just because I liked them. They were because they went along. I felt they resonated with the scripture. And Jake always says that he's always unsure if my choices are going to be correct, but then he preaches and it all works together. So um, I generally um, plan quite a bit in advance, which is, I guess, a different thing than here we both do. And um, yeah, I have, I've asked some people to join me to help pick songs, so it's not just me, and because I don't know what y'all sing, and you don't know what I know, and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, we plan them about a month in advance, and yeah, we're always looking for more people to play. So I don't know all the hidden musical talents, but I hope to get to know them well very soon. Great. Is there any ways that, uh, that you would ask for specific prayer requests for you while you were in this role for so we can know what to pray for you for? Yeah, thank you. Um, the first thing is just the stress of the next couple months with moving, hopefully, maybe, and someday, and, and um, the holidays and everything, and just getting things organized. And then long term, just that I will always listen to the Holy Spirit. Thank you. I think that's the end of okay. my list. Do you have anything else that no, you would like I'm to good. say that I didn't ask? Okay. Thank you for all your participation. It's been great. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. Uh, brothers and sisters, it is now time for our congregational prayer. Uh, this morning is Orphan Sunday, and next week we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, and some very particular ways to pray, but it's just going to be a theme uh, through our prayer this morning. So I wanted you to be aware. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are good to us. Lord, when we were far from you, orphaned and abandoned and wallowing in our own sin, you came to us. You became a man. You died on the cross, Lord Jesus, so that we could find you, so that we could be resurrected from our spiritual deadness, and you could adopt us into your family. Almighty God, this is the core fundamental truth of the gospel. We were far from you, we were broken, and you not only made us clean, you not only started to heal us, but you adopted us into your very family, and we are now the children of God. We praise you, Heavenly Father. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you have already done in us. Lord, as we look around our world, we can see others that are in need of your healing, in need of your love. God, as we see those who may not have a home or those who are struggling with their nuclear family, uh, we ask that you would provide your spirit to give us courage to rise up and to say, this is not the way it's meant to be to rise up in love and in compassion and mercy and grace to be family to those who are family-less. To be shelter to those who are adrift.
God, it's not right that when moms and dads have problems, it's the kids that bear the burden. It's not right that the most vulnerable in our communities, in our culture, in our world, are the children who haven't done anything to deserve it. It's not right, Lord God, that the little ones, whether they be part of a family or in foster care or an orphan, it's not right that they're overlooked or forgotten. And we know this, Almighty God, because of you. Because your story throughout Scripture reminds us, shows us how you came to the vulnerable. You came to those who are hurting. And you gave them a family. Your story tells us about how you came to a world that was broken and bleeding and in need of redemption. And you, Lord Jesus, were our Savior. And so now, Almighty God, we are your church, your people, your kingdom here in this world, and we have the awesome opportunity to share what you have done for us with others. But we cannot do it in our own strength, Lord God. So we ask your spirit to fill us and mold us and shape us as we bring your kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, from earth to heaven from heaven to earth. And we ask that, Lord, every time we say the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning, why hello, you were right there. Uh, Our scripture passage this morning is Genesis chapter 38, verses... 24 through 30. I was about to say 20 through 34, and I knew that wasn't right. 24 through 30. So if you'd like to turn there, Genesis chapter 38, verses 24 through 30. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Shelah. And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, This one came out first. But when he drew his hand back, His brother came out, and she said, So this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was given the name Zara. Thank you so much, Tracy. Brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Christ, our single concern. Amen. Amen. Uh, This begins the first series uh, after my 
Introduction to Who Jake Is series. Uh, and this is an Advent series that is going to take longer than just Advent. So we're at the beginning of November, and we're starting a, a preaching series through Advent. Uh, and it's called The Women of Jesus' Genealogy. And the reason why we're going through this is very, very important. And so let me tell you a story. Uh, back in June, I had just found out that you all were wanting to call me. So I hadn't even officially accepted your call yet, I don't think. And I sat down at the computer and I said, what is it that God wants me to share with you all? And one of the major things that I do professionally is preach. And one of, it's one of the major time commitment. it's the major time commitment in, in my week is preparing morning and evening ser- sermons. And what you're going to find is that is very, very important to me. I do not take that lightly. Uh, it's really easy when you know the Bible well to make the Bible say whatever you want. And if you don't believe me, um, just, you just start playing around on YouTube and you can find preachers who can tell you all kinds of interesting things. With the authority of Scripture, so to speak, because they're manipulating Scripture and making Scripture say what they want it to say. That's not what we are supposed to do. We are people of the book, which means that we come to the Bible not as we come to a textbook, not as we come to a story, not as we come to anything else. And rather than being the master over that book, we allow the Scriptures to master us. We open ourselves and we say to the Bible, we say to the Holy Spirit who works through the Bible, we say, God, I want to be like you. And you've given us your word to show us who you are. And so rather than making the scriptures be what I want them to be, we come to the scriptures and ask that they would shape us and mold us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ who is our head. And so this is how I approach preaching. When I come to a series, as we're going to see as soon as after, just after Christmas, we're going to look at the book of Matthew. And Matthew was important because it tells about how Jesus is the anointed king. And that's why I wanted to start with it, is because this is such an important message for us to hear, both today and in the time of Jesus. And so normally when I preach through a book, we take it one chapter or so at a time. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But usually a chapter at a time because the biblical writers wanted to tell you something. They're not just giving us proof text so we can assume things. They're writing a coherent message that is helpful for us to understand. And so I try to hold intention, all of the truth, in the, each section of Scripture, but also the singular narrative that the books are trying to communicate. And that's really, really hard, as you all will soon find out, because there's a lot going on in the Bible. A whole lot. And the, the authors are trying to communicate really wonderful things as well. So I love to get in touch with the scriptures. I love to open up the scriptures so we as a community can see what God was doing with God's people when the scriptures were written and to understand it well. So that way when we look around in our world, we can say, how would God have me act today? I don't do it just for knowledge. We don't preach just so you can say, I learned something new today. Isn't that great? We do this, we come together, I open up scripture, I study for hours and hours every week because I want you to leave here and say, how does God want me to act in the world? How does he want me to carry his kingdom into the world today? And one of the very, very important things that I have discovered uh, by going through seminary and since seminary and by preaching and all these wonderful things is that the Bible Uh, The central truth of the Bible is very, very plain. No one, unless they're really, really not paying attention, no one can go through Scripture and assume that they can buy God off. No one can go through Scripture and assume that they can do enough to earn their salvation. 
That is not present. And if you think it is, we need to have a conversation. That's clear as day. And so the main truth of Scripture is easy to understand for anybody who would read it. But the Scriptures were written, some of them, 3,000 years ago. And not only that, but they were written to a culture that was vastly different than our Western culture today. And so they say things, or they're assuming things, that we might not know or might not be able to assume on our own. And so it's helpful when we're able to really get into the nitty-gritty about the Bible and find out what it is that God's doing back then with those people, the people that the Bible was written to, so that way we can understand what God would have us do today, the people that it was written for. An easy way, uh, a clever way to show you what I mean by this is when, we re- when you read the words, it's a strike! That's a strike. Sorry, I didn't even say it right. That's a strike. Who here knows what I mean? See, you all know what I'm, none of you, like four of you raised your hands. If I was talking about bowling, what would a strike mean? Do you, right? If we're talking about baseball, does it mean the same thing as bowling? No. If we're talking about the UAW, does it mean the same thing as a sports? No. If we're talking about the Air Force, does it mean the same thing at all? No. Context matters so much because just reading the words can be misleading if we don't know what they're talking about. Keep that in mind, okay? And then the second thing that gets really interesting, and I find it absolutely amazing, uh, idioms and, cul- and, and customs, all right? How many of you have ever taken a casserole to someone? Yeah? You're all giggling. How many of you have this exact same casserole dish in your house? (laughs) Right? Some of you do, right? If you were to tell me, I took so-and-so a casserole, my follow-up is not about the food. I would say to you, how are they doing? Right? Yes. Because this is a custom in America, and it's a really good custom. When someone needs a casserole, we're saying either that a tragedy has happened, or they're hurt, or a wonderful thing has happened. Maybe they've, they had a baby. But no matter what the circumstances are, they are incapable of making food for themselves. And so we all know, if I say to you, I took them a casserole, I'm not talking about casseroles, <laughs> right? This is a custom, all right? In our scripture text this morning, in the, in the story, we're going to hear about uh, Leverite marriage. And it's not even Leverite marriage because that wasn't formalized until the time of Moses. This was pre-Leverite marriage. And all of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's why we're talking about it. Okay? In the biblical days, there was no such thing as welfare. There was no nation state that could take care of women or orphans. And so the way that women would be taken care of if their husband died is that they would have to have a son in order to raise up an heir. And if there is an heir, the family as a whole will look after that son. Okay? It's hard for us to understand this because we live in a different time and place, but that's just the way it was. If you had a husband who died and you didn't have an heir, you were nothing. No one would care for you. You had no future. You were all alone. You were vulnerable and without hope just because your husband died. And so the cultural custom of the day was that the woman would have an heir with her husband's brother. And in Moses' time, this was formalized into an actual marriage, but it's not marriage in the story that we're going to read today. It's just having a baby, a baby boy particularly. And we look at that and we say, Isn't that incest? 
I know you're all thinking it. And you kids who don't know what that is, guess what you get to ask mom and dad today? (laughs) Isn't the Bible great? (laughs) We say that's weird. And from our perspective, it is weird. I will grant you that. But in their time and place, it was the means that they had to be compassionate and to look after those who were vulnerable. Is that clear? So this is a custom that we're looking at, and from our perspective, the whole thing just looks kooky. It's just like, whoa. But in their context, it was a means of compassion and grace and taking care of those who were vulnerable. All right? So we are going to go through uh, Genesis chapter 38 this morning, the entire chapter. Uh, We don't have time to read through it and then to walk through it, so I'm going to tell you the story and highlight the bits that we need to know. If you want to follow along, feel free to have your Bible open to Genesis chapter 38. So you can go to the, the last slide there, Jeff. Oh, so one thing that I want to share with you uh, that I, I, I forgot as I was going through this stuff, this is a really exciting time to be a Christian, okay? In the last 50 years since the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have had an unbelievable uh, flood of archaeology that helps us to understand the customs and the, the, the uh, practices of the biblical culture. We are 10 to 100 times more Sorry, we have 10 to 100 times more material now than 50 years ago that help us to understand the, the culture that the Bible was written into, other things that the people of Jesus' day actually said about the Bible. It's an amazing time to be alive. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And so if you read the commentary of somebody like John Wesley or Calvin uh, or even somebody in the early 20th century, they might not have all of the information that I'm going to share with you, and that's simply because they didn't have it. And so some of the things that I'm saying might be new, and you might be scratching your head and be like, that's not what I learned as a kid. Th- this is what archaeology does. It doesn't change the central truth of Scripture. It just helps us to have a mole a more fully uh, fleshed out understanding of, the, of what God was doing with God's people back then, which helps us to understand what God would have God's people do today. So, Genesis chapter 38. The setup for the story. Um, when we come to the, the story of, of Je- the, when we come to the stories of the women of Jesus' genealogy, usually the assumption is, isn't God gracious to allow someone who messed up the way that Tamar did into the genealogy of Jesus? Isn't God gracious to have someone like Rahab in the genealogy of Jesus? Isn't God gracious to have someone like Ruth or Bathsheba or Mary in the genealogy of Jesus? And that's all the farther that we go with it. Usually because we just don't know what to do with the stories that we read about these five women. We just don't know. And, and that's good. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So anytime you assume that, that's a great thing. But the, Matthew is not saying that when he puts these five women into the scripture. When he writes their names on, in the genealogy, he is by no means saying, look at how much they messed up. Isn't God kind and loving to let them in the genealogy of Jesus? It's actually the opposite. Just the fact that they were named means that Matthew wants us to remember their story and to know what God was doing then because that's what God is doing in Jesus as well. And so now most of you are like, okay, what does that have to do with Tamar? I'm so glad you asked. In the story of Genesis, the whole point is God is trying to bring his kingdom into the world. If you, if you think back to the series that we just finished before, uh, it, starting in August, God is bringing his kingdom of shalom into the world. And when God created the world good, Human beings were the ones who were supposed to continue to send that out in the world, but they screwed up. And so they were far from God. They were exiled from God's presence. And God chose to enter into the story. God chose to come near to people in order to bring about his kingdom of goodness and of peace and of flourishing. 
And so God chose Abraham and Sarah and their descendants in order to show the world what his kingdom was like. And God said to them, I will bless you and you will be a blessing for the whole world. And this blessing, this is the kingdom. This is the, the, uh, the power. This is the revelation of the goodness of God flowing out to all creation. Now, Abraham was one man, and when God called him, he was 75 years old and had no heir. And so this whole idea of Abraham being blessed and that blessing going on to all the world was a huge act of faith. And one, one of the major themes of the book of Genesis is through whom is God going to bring about this revelation of goodness? Through whom is, going, is God going to bring the blessing to all the world? And so that's why we get these stories that don't make a lot of sense to us, all right? So we have Abraham, and he had his son Isaac. And Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And through a number of shenanigans, Jacob, who was the younger one, got the blessing and the birthright. And so he's the heir, so we follow his story. And so then Jacob has sons. And Jacob has his firstborn, Reuben. And so the assumption is that Reuben will be the one through whom the kingdom, will, through whom the blessing will come. Only Reuben screws up. Reuben proves himself unworthy for the blessing. So now who's it going to be? Well, the second and third sons are Simeon and Levi. And so now, okay, Simeon and Levi, they're the ones that are going to be, be the, the source of blessing for the world. Only they screwed up. They're not going to be the ones. And so the fourthborn, Leah's fourthborn son, is named Judah. Is Judah going to be the one through whom the blessing through the entire world happens? But there's a rival. Rachel is also having children now. Rachel has her son Joseph, and Rachel was the favored wife. And so is Joseph going to be the heir? Is Joseph going to be the one through whom the kingdom, the, the blessing and the power is coming? Or is it going to be Judah? And so this is the tension. Isn't it? it it's supposed to be more like a soap opera than it is about a, a history lesson. You're supposed to be like, oh my goodness, I can't wait till next week to read the next chapter of Genesis. Because how is this story going to unfold? And so in Genesis chapter 37, Joseph, who is being shown to be the heir, okay? Jacob is playing favorites. And even though he's the 10th born, uh, 11th born son, he's the 11th born son. And Jacob is making him the heir. How many of you were parts of a 12-person family? Not many of you. How many of you would have felt really antsy if your little brother or sister was shown to be the favorite? <laughs> the rest of you are lying. <laughs> the rest of the brothers hated the fact that Joseph was the heir. And so what do they do? Joseph comes out to tattle on them, and they come up to him, and they throw him in a pit. They were going to kill him, but Reuben is able to, to save that, and he doesn't let Joseph die. But then, guess what? Some slave traders come by. And guess who suggests that they should sell Joseph to the slavers? Judah! The fourth-born son! The, oh, the last hope! Oh my goodness, what is wrong with Jacob? How is he such a horrible parent that four of his kids screwed up so bad? How can the, the blessing come through Judah? He's selling his brother to slave traders who take him to a pagan country in Egypt. What is going on? And so Jacob, or sorry, jo Joseph is often in Egypt. Judah has just sold his brother into slavery. And to make matters worth, worse, the brothers bring Jacob, or the brothers bring Joseph's multicolored coat, the sign of favoritism, and they've dipped it in blood. And they come up to Jacob and they say, recognize. Do you know whose coat this is? And he says, oh, my son, he's dead. This is what Judah has participated in. This is what Judah has done. 
He's unworthy to be the heir. And to make matters worse, the beginning of chapter 38, the beginning of our story, not only has he sold his brother into slavery, he leaves the family. They're the only people in all of the land of Canaan who worship Elohim, the God of Israel. And Judah leaves the family. He leaves and he moves in with a Canaanite from Adullam. And so if you are rooting for Judah, oh, geez, your odds are really bad right now. He leaves the family, the only people who worship Elohim in the whole land, and he goes and he moves in with a Canaanite. He marries a Canaanite. He raises up kids, Ur and Onan and Shelah, with a Canaanite. He marries his son to a Canaanite. If you're not paying attention, he's acting like a Canaanite. That's not what God's people are meant to do. What's going on, God? Where's your promise? Where's your kingdom? Where's your, your blessings to the world? And so Judah marries his firstborn son, Ur, to a woman named Tamar. And the text tells us that Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord. Jacob doesn't know this. He was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord killed him. And so Judah did the honorable thing, the custom, and he, mar- he didn't marry. He gave Tamar to his second son, Onan, for the purpose of raising up a son. They're not married. They're only raising up a son. They're only having a baby boy. That's the only reason they're together. And so Onan goes into Tamar in order to make a baby, but he doesn't do his job. If you want the specifics, read the text. The last time I preached this series, I couldn't read it out loud because it's scandalous. (laughs) Children, ask your parents what I'm talking about. (laughs) He didn't do his duty. He's taking advantage of her. Tamar is relying on this family to be her source of security and of life in the world. And Onan is taking advantage of her. And the text clearly says what he did was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord struck him down. Again, we know that. Judah didn't know that. In Judah's mind, he's had two sons who have been with Tamar and two sons have died. He's got a third boy. He's not yet of age. He's looking at Shayla. You're all I have left. And so he says to Tamar, go back to your, fa- your father's house. Stay there as a widow until Shayla comes of age. Judah had no intention of giving Shayla to Tamar. We see that because he doesn't give Shayla to Tamar. Judah is leaving her vulnerable. Judah is keeping her in a state of suspense. She's no longer a member of his household because he sent her away. She's no longer a member of her father's household because she was married to Ur. She's nothing. She has no future and no hope. She's vulnerable. And a long time goes by. Judah's wife dies. Judah is going to shear his sheep. Tamar finds out that Judah is going to shear his sheep. And so Tamar acts. Tamar covers her face with a veil so she will not be recognized. Tamar goes to the town of Ainim, Ain. Ein aim, which means opening of the eyes. She's disguised herself in the city known as opening of the eyes. And Judah comes to her and assumes she's a prostitute. And when it's talking, when later, when his friend comes back, we'll talk about that in a second, Judah assumes that she's a cult prostitute a shrine prostitute. Now, some of you might not know this, but um, intimate relations between men and women are a great source of power. Science today even tells us that intimate relationships between men and women are a great source of power. It does things for your body, it makes you relationally connected, all kinds of stuff. Back in the day that we're talking about, 
it was also a great source of religious power. And so the vast majority of cults of idol worship in, Canaan, of, in the land of Canaan revolved around somehow performing intimate acts between men and women as your worship to idols. Do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine that for a minute. You come to church, and we don't sit in pews, but we do other things. Okay? That's a really graphic image, and you all are like, why would he do that to me? Because this is how people worshipped, even during Jesus' time. That's why the God of Israel was so crazy unique, because he never asked that of his people. Never, ever, ever. But this was how the Canaanites worshipped, particularly if you were worshiping, worshiping the fertility goddess. If you felt that you needed children to carry on your line, you would go to a temple prostitute and do things with her to give you the power of the fertility goddess. So, just to make it clear, what is Judah doing when he goes into Tamar? He's committing idolatry. He's not just trying to fill some physical need. He's committing idolatry. He's going to worship at the altar of the Canaanite goddess of fertility because he doesn't know why he's lost his kids and he wants immortality. He's so far gone from the family of God that this is acceptable to him. So he goes in to Tamar, who's dressed, who's disguised herself. He says, what can I pay you? And she says, a young goat. And he says, well, I don't have it with me. And she says, give me your driver's license and passport. It's not what she says because they didn't have cars. She says, give me your staff and your seal and your cord. That was basically the same thing. We don't need to go into what those are. Just think driver's license. It was the one thing that everybody would know whose it was. So they do their thing, and then she goes back, puts back on her widow's clothes in her father's house, remember, where she has no value, where she has no say. She's not even a member of her father's family anymore. And you want to know how we know that? Because when she's found to be pregnant, who gets to declare her dead? Who is the one that says, burn her because she committed adultery? Who is the one who has authority and power over her? It's not her own father. It's Judah. The one who abandoned her. The one who left her vulnerable. The one who took advantage of her. Because he didn't know what he was doing. And so Tamar comes. And this is one of the most amazing scenes in all of the Bible. Tamar comes. She's pregnant. She's being dragged before her father-in-law to be executed for adultery. And she says, these... She, she says, recognize. Remember, that's exactly what Jacob's son said to him after they got rid of Joseph. Recognize. These are, belong to the man who is the father of my child. What does Judah say? Look at it. Look at it in your text. What does Judah say? She's more righteous than I. She's more righteous than I. This woman who was vulnerable, this woman who had nothing, this woman who had no power at all, did the only thing that she could to make things right. The only thing that was accessible to her to make things right. And she did it because she believed that a God would honor her. She did it because she believed that justice was a real deal and not just something made up in her head. She did it because she believed that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would stand up for her. She did the only thing she could to bring justice to the world. So, did it work? Did God honor her? Did God see her? Okay, first off, end of the chapter. How many kids does she have? Two. How many kids did J Judah lose? Two. Is God restoring the things that were taken away because of wickedness when justice comes? Yes. 
Don't miss that. The fact that she has twins is not just a comment on the genetics of the people of Israel. Judah lost two sons, and God is restoring that which was lost because it's right. And it's right through Tamar. How else do we know that God is honoring the actions that Tamar chose to do? Well, first of all, let's follow up with the story. Before Tamar, Judah was falling off the rails, and he was selling his brother into slavery. After Tamar, the next time we hear him in in the story, he first of all offers his own life on behalf of Benjamin to his father. He says, Dad, if anything happens to Benny, I will be the one to bear the cost. You can take it out on me. Later, and this is awesome, later when he doesn't know that he's talking to his brother Joseph but thinks he's talking to the second most powerful man in the world. Joseph says, I'm throwing your brother, your brother Benjamin in jail. I'm throwing him in jail. And Judah says, no, no, no. Do whatever you want to me, but you cannot have him. He will, that will break my father's heart. Take me. Take me instead. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Isn't he a great example of the kingdom of God in the world? Isn't this the kingdom that God wanted through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants and the people of God today? Who is he? He's the heir. He's the one that's doing all the things that God wants. He's the heir. And how did he become this way? Through Genesis 38. Through his interactions with Tamar. Brothers and sisters, I have a closing story, but we don't have time for it right now. So if you want to hear it, please come talk to me afterwards. But know this, brothers and sisters. God sees and is near and is working justice and making things right for the vulnerable in our world. Jesus Christ will come as king over all things and make all things right. This is the hope that we have. That means that we, his people, get the opportunity to work for justice now. And so when you see those in our families, in our world, in our communities that are vulnerable, God wants you to speak up. God wants you to reach out and to meet them. If you yourselves feel vulnerable, if you feel that you've been pushed away, if you feel that people have taken advantage of you and that no one will listen to you and that you are rejected, God sees you. God cares for you. God will make it right for you. And God loves you. I want to see you. I don't know you now, but I want to. I want to hear your story, and I will believe you. I want to be there the way that God has been there for me. And one final word of warning, brothers and sisters. Some people in our world are oppressors. Maybe some people in our community here at Emmanuel have taken advantage of other people or have pushed other people away or have worked to keep people out who are supposed to be welcomed in. Brothers and sisters, our God is going to make things right. Don't forget, don't miss the opportunity to repent right now, to lay before the Almighty God, the forgiving God, whatever it is you might have done, to ask forgiveness and to follow in the ways of Jesus as we bring the kingdom of God to this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good to us. And we need you. We cannot do it on our own, but your spirit through your, gives us your power so that we can bring your kingdom. Give us courage, Lord God. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our song of response.
Brothers and sisters, receive now this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen. All right, guys, we are going to sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. A cappella, because you guys are amazing singers. So all those parts, I want to hear them. All right. So here we go. Mm-hmm. 